All right. Well, thank you, Dave. Thank you all for joining us. Tonight, we're going to be talking about managing oaks for wildlife. And so we're going to touch base a little bit on why we care about oaks, why oaks are important for wildlife, how we can manage our woodlands to improve the conditions for our oaks. And we're going to talk about some bigger picture landscape scale planning. So welcome, everyone. Hope you enjoy the program and hopefully you learn a lot tonight. We're going to start out with Dave Apsley with OSU Extension, talking about oaks in general. So again, my name is Dave Apsley. Um, I work for Ohio State University Extension, and I'm a forester and a natural resource specialist. And so I'm here to talk to you a bit about why we care about oaks, first of all. Kind of some of the trends and some of the things we're seeing that are happening with oak in Ohio. Talk a bit about oak ecology and some of the adaptations that oaks have to fire. We'll talk a little bit about the solutions to some of our oak regeneration problems. And then to just start off a little bit, and I'm going to make one adjustment here because I can't see my audience here. So I'd like to at least see how many folks are out there and what's going on. So first of all, I'd always like to start out a lot of my extension presentations um, with a little information about forests and forestry in Ohio. And this map is one of my favorites. It's a little old, it's 2014, but we've got about 8 million acres of forest in Ohio. It makes up about 30% of our landscape. We've got more acreage of forest in Ohio than we've got corn and soybeans combined. Most of that woodlands, 85% of it is privately owned. And 70% of that is owned by family forest owners, like many of you who are on the call tonight are. 66% of our forest is in these Appalachian counties in eastern and southern Ohio. And those forests contribute about $27 billion to Ohio's economy, which is about 20 to 25% of Ohio's total agricultural economy. This is a map of the eastern United States. It's a bit older map to show you the oak dominated forest in the eastern United States. The brown are the oak hickory or an oak dominated forest. There's a little bit of oak pine if you go further to the south, but we probably don't have many, if any, forests classified as oak pine naturally. And we're in this unglaciated Allegheny Plateau area. So that's again where most of our oak forest is in Ohio or oak dominated forest. What's interesting about oaks is we have an oak for just about every soil and site condition from the extreme wet conditions, swampy areas, which we don't have a lot of acreage in swamp land or wetland areas in Southern and, and Southeastern Ohio, or even Ohio in general, to some extremely dry ridges and South facing slopes. So when you start looking at the, these are the predominant oak species we've got in Ohio. We've got some that live almost exclusively in swampy wet areas. We've got some that will grow on the very driest of sites including blackjack and post oak. And then we've got several, most of our more valuable oaks as far as the timber side of things are in this middle area that grow on these more mesic sites that aren't super dry or aren't super wet. It's pretty amazing how many species of oak we've got in Ohio. So why do we care about oaks? Well, first of all, they can live for hundreds of years. So they're kind of that stability, that, that stabilizing force that uh, stabilizes these forest communities. They provide habitat to a wide variety of wildlife species and Dave Runkel is gonna talk quite a bit about that later. And then these oaks contribute greatly to Ohio's forest industry, which I already mentioned is very important to the economy, especially when you look at Appalachian, Ohio. But when we look at the statistics, about two thirds of the trees that are harvested in Ohio are oaks. So they're getting a lot of pressure. I'm not going to spend much, if any, time on this. Just to show you, this is a wonderful resource. It's called Oak Forest Ecosystems, McShay and Healy. But just a few key stats, and I might steal some of Dave's thunder, but about 90 species of wildlife depend on acorns. Acorns are just so amazingly important. And then Dave's also going to talk about some of the other habitat elements that oaks provide for wildlife 
and that range of wildlife is is amazing. Uh, we always think of squirrels, but it goes way beyond squirrels. The other thing to mention that oaks also depend on wildlife. So the big way that oaks distribute their seed or their acorns any distance at all is through wildlife. Squirrels, mice, chipmunks, blue jays, etc. There's some neat work. I think Dave's probably going to mention it later, so I won't talk about it, but some work happening in Southeast Ohio about the importance of blue jays and, and their role in moving oaks and acorns around. Oops. Wood from oak is very valuable. It's noted for its strength and durability. The species in the white oak group especially are very rot resistant. They have high energy value when it comes to BTUs if you're using it for fuel. Um, they're highly prized for just the appearance. And uh, here in Jackson, Ohio, there's a fairly new phenomenon. It's a major cooperage that moved into Jackson about four miles from where I'm sitting tonight. And they're producing white oak bourbon barrels at the rate of about 1,500 a day. Um, so that's another important use of white oak barrels. And what's so exciting for us here in Ohio is that, especially in Appalachian, Ohio, we don't add a lot of value to wood. So trees are harvested and they've been shipped all over the state and in the country and around the world, but very few instances where we're actually adding value or creating jobs locally in Appalachian, Ohio from some of these products. Oaks can live a long time, like I mentioned, just some of the average lifespans of some of the species of these white oak and chestnut are probably the longer lived. Again, the white oak group, which includes chestnut oak, tend to have more rot resistance. They can seal off or heal off wounds more effectively than some of the red oak group can. This old black and white, grainy black and white photo is actually a photo of my property from 1951. And you look around, there's these few scattered big canopy trees. And this one actually is still there, and several of these are still there. But this is a large white oak that has been there for a long time. And when you look at that photo, you're seeing a lot of open ground with a few scattered trees. And that's evidence of the fact that this property had a lot of intensive grazing on it. And so those trees, especially the white oaks, survived that heavy intensive grazing period. And many of the trees that are there are the offspring of those trees. That's the big white oak I mentioned. It's probably over 40 inches in diameter, extremely tall, wonderful bat habitat. Um, in the evening, in the summer months, you'll see bats that are roosting up under there come out at, at dusk. Oaks are also important for the future. Um, Lewis Iverson out of the Northern Research Station out of Delaware, Ohio, has done quite a bit of work predicting responses of a variety of species to potential climate change and under a variety of scenarios. And in almost all those scenarios, the oak group seems to fare quite well under the predicted climate change. So they could very well add that st stability well into the future. And with few exceptions, northern red oak may not do as well, but most of these species will be more competitive or very competitive in hotter and drier conditions that might come with climate change. So this is kind of what we're seeing. It's got us a bit concerned. When we look at the comparison to our oak species and maple species, they make up about half of our canopy in southeastern Ohio. This data is from a 17 county area from about Scioto County over to Monroe County. So along the river in that next tier or two of counties to the north. So oaks and maples make up about 50% of the canopy. And of those large trees, about 70% of those are oak. When we start looking at smaller diameter trees, say from five to 15 inches in diameter, you're seeing a major shift, almost a flip-flop. We've got a lot more maple, and this is mostly red maple, in those smaller diameter classes from small salt timber down to these pole-sized trees. And then when we drop down to the inch to five inch class, you can see even more of a shift where only 20% of that region is oak in that one to 4.9 inch diameter class where there's a lot more maple there. So it's not hard to envision if we harvest trees out of this canopy 
and don't do anything else, we're going to have these smaller trees in the understory work their way up into the canopy. So we're seeing some shifts. Um, again, we've got lots of oak hickory forest in Southeast Ohio and in Ohio in general, but most of them are large diameter class. We don't have a lot of smaller, younger oak stands coming on for the future. And in those large diameter oak stands, we don't have smaller trees in the of oak species under them either. So we're not seeing sufficient regeneration to ensure their future. And the one that concerns us probably the most is white oak. Um, for a couple of reasons, the harvesting pressure is pretty heavy for the removals. We've also had some mortality in the past 20 years or so. It's been a little bit high. And so it's one of the few species where the growth, the net growth, so that's growth minus mortality, um, relationship to removal is below one. So that means we're cutting it at a little bit faster rate than it's replacing what we're cutting. Other species like red maple and sugar maple, we're cutting at a lot, lot lower rate. It's actually growing three times faster than we're harvesting. And that's true for many species, but most of the oaks are closer to one. There's black oak and northern red oak. But white oak right now is a bit upside down. So that's got us concerned. So what's causing those trends? Things have changed in the ecosystem. The type, the frequency, and the severity of disturbance in our forest has changed. Fire is a big thing we'll talk about, but fire is a driver in oak and um, oaks respond well to fire. And it's been absent from the landscape for nearly 80 years. Livestock grazing, like the example that I showed you from my property has decreased greatly. We don't like to see cattle in the woods, but I think a lot of the forests that we see today are here because of past land use. So if you think about that pastured woods that I showed the aerial of, if the only remaining trees from the grazing were oaks, then they're going to do well regenerating themselves because the competition is not there and the light conditions are favorable for oak as well. And then finally, timber harvesting practices have shifted towards individual trees. So we just take a few trees out of the canopy and without a lot of extra practices, we're not going to create the right light conditions for oak to regenerate. These harvests often target dominant oaks. It's almost like oaks have a bounty on them. They're valuable, they're targeted, and we're not removing in many of their competitors. So we're shifting the balance. Most of the harvests we do just do not allow enough light to reach the forest floor for oaks to regenerate. Also want to mention oaks have lots of fire adaptations. If you look at this picture of Todd, uh, this is a young oak seedling probably not as young as you might think, but look at the balance between this root system and this top. The strategy for many oaks is that they put a lot of energy into the root system. They've also got relatively thick bark so they can uh, survive fire. They have the ability to block off and seal off that damage so that the rot doesn't continue to decay in that tree. And then they have these relatively large root system with buds right here at the ground line or just below the ground line. So they can invest energy in the root system and then following disturbance like fire, they have the ability to aggressively sprout. And then finally, oak leaves are pretty much designed to burn. If you ever try to walk in an oak forest and be quiet, um, it's pretty noisy where other species like maples tend to mat down and they uh, decompose rather quickly. Oaks do not decompose as quickly and they make excellent fuel for fire. So the strategy for oaks is essentially, they've got these cyclic acorn crops. You're gonna get these huge pulses of oak regeneration at irregular intervals. So during those big acorn crop years, when the squirrels and the other wildlife can't eat all of them, you'll get this pulse of regeneration. And if they have adequate resources, mainly light, they can invest quite a bit of energy into their large root systems. And then following a disturbance, they can grow rapidly and compete very well. Without the adequate light and without that disturbance, 
oaks are regenerating at much lower rates than they probably did historically. So in order to get them to establish, they need an intermediate level of light. Um, I always like to talk about Goldilocks. If it's too sunny and too bright, almost full sun, uh, it's too, too bright and oaks can't compete well there. Yellow poplar, cherry, sycamore, things like that are going to outcompete them there. If it's too shady, things like maple and beech are going to outcompete them there. So where they do the best are conditions like you're seeing in this image, where this mid-story has been removed, part of the canopy is gone, and we have almost a solid layer of oak regeneration underneath. The other thing to consider, oaks can't compete well unless they're considerable size. Historically, that meant they had to be about four and a half feet tall. Now we look a lot more at that root color. So right where the root and the, the stem intersect right at the ground line, we like to see those root colors say as big as your thumb, about three quarters of an inch in diameter. When they're that big and there's disturbance such as fire, they can compete very well. If they're much smaller than that, then their chances decrease greatly. And then once you get this regen in the understory, it, it won't survive forever because it'll sh get shaded again from other species. So at that point, you really need to think about getting more light to those and releasing them into the canopy as your future forest. Here's just a slide to show shade tolerance. That means their ability to live in shade. And these species out here, there aren't many oaks in this list that do well in full sunlight or that these species need full sunlight to do well. Scarlet oak is one of the few oaks that needs quite a bit of light to do well. On the opposite end of the spectrum, these species can tolerate and survive in shade. A sugar maple, beech, and eastern hemlock are species that can grow in almost total shade, 1% or 2% sunlight, and they can survive. Where oaks need more light than that to be able to survive and to work their way in and up into the canopy. So Stephanie's going to talk about this a bit later, but I just wanted to show you the conditions that oaks probably do well in. This is a study that Todd Hutchinson, again, out of the Northern Research Station out of Delaware, is leading. Um, they removed the mid-story. They didn't do much removal of the canopy at all. They removed the mid-story, predominantly of maple, beech, and some black gum. And they went from 2% full sunlight, which is what it was prior to the treatment, to about 18% full sunlight. These conditions allow oak to build that big tap root and become competitive. Under these conditions, the oaks don't have much of a chance. And one of the final things I wanna mention that it's relatively easy to regenerate oak on the driest of sites. You get very thin soils on a south or west facing slope or up on the highest of ridges where the soils are thin. Um, they, it's relatively easy to regenerate oak. What's amazing to me here in southeastern Ohio is how much oak we have on these moist sites, which it's very difficult to regenerate them there. And that all goes back to that past land use, either livestock and past agriculture or things like the iron furnace industry created conditions that allowed oak to do well, but we don't have those conditions. So it's as we get to drier sites, it's a little easier to manage for oak. So some things to think about, if you really want to have successful oak regeneration, you have to have it there prior to the harvest. If you wait, you harvest and expect the regeneration to show up later, it's going to be a tough battle. It's an uphill climb. And then once you get that regen, you've got to release it before it gets shaded again. So in a nutshell, no pun intended there, uh, cut and pray rarely works. You've got a plan to manage new oak seedlings before and after good acorn crops. You need to use treatments that improve the competitive, competitiveness of these seedlings. Prescribed fire is one of those treatments that Stephanie will talk about a bit. Removing some of that lower shade is another one. And even partial remover, removal of some of the overstory. So if we're thinking about regenerating oak, the classic way that we harvest it's not to say that you can't remove single trees and be successful if you do everything right in the understory, but most of the harvests that occur in Ohio on private lands 
are what we call high grade harvest. And the folks harvesting aren't trained to really understand how to regenerate the oak. So we're taking dominant oaks out of the canopy. We're leaving the competing species out there, not only in the canopy, but below the canopy. So we need to look at harvesting methods that will allow a bit more light into the forest floor, um, but not too much. If you do clear cuts and you're not managing it, you're probably not going to get oak to come back either. Um, I've heard that for years that clear cutting will get oak back. We've got lots of examples where we've seen clear cuts that started out 80 plus percent oak. And after the clear cut, they're probably less than 10 or 15 percent oak. So single trees and clear cuts are not the answer. We've got to work somewhere to something in the middle that allows a little bit more light into the understory. But we've also got to remove that interfering vegetation down low. So we want the forest to look, if we want oak to regenerate it, we need it to look more like what's in the understory or in the bottom layer here. But there are some breaks in the canopy. You can look up and see some light through where many of our forests look like this, where this layer in the middle is predominantly red maple here in southeastern Ohio. Something we've been working on a lot with partners, including a lot of the folks that are on here tonight. Um, so something we're well aware of, and there's an interagency effort to, to address it. And then finally, I wanna end up off topic a little bit and to mention that we have, if you're not familiar with our Day in the Woods program, if you go to u.osu.edu slash Southeast Ohio Woods, SE Ohio Woods, and I'll put this in the chat window when I'm done speaking or Stephanie, if you can stick it in there, that'd be great. We've got lots of resources, including lots of recordings, and you guys get a sneak peek if you want. We have a new series of videos on woodland boundaries, which we're going to feature in our Day in the Woods programming this Friday. So Friday, December 10th at 10 a.m., we're going to have a program on the importance of maintaining woodland boundaries and how you go about doing that. So if you're interested, um, the post below this one about tonight's meeting will show you how to register. So if you go to u.osu.edu, slash Southeast Ohio, S E Ohio Woods, you can find this information. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Stephanie. Thanks, Dave. So we do have one You're question welcome. that came up in the chat. Are forest fires ever really an issue in Ohio? Good question. You want me to take that or you want to take that, Stephanie? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> they can be but rarely. Um, we have a spring fire season that happens a lot of springs in southeast and it's predominantly in southeast Ohio and probably the areas where we have the hottest and the most expansive fires are going to be the furthest south in the, in the state. Um, typically Lawrence and Scioto County down in that part of the state is where we're probably going to have the most fire. It's also where we got some of the most expansive forests, but we did have a fairly large fire gosh, what year was that season? Um, a few years after the ice storm, when there was a lot of material down after a very dry summer, um, if we have extreme drought conditions in, in the summer and we have a dry fall, then we can occasionally have some fairly severe fire seasons. Um, almost always man cause somebody arsonist or somebody just doing something that's um, not wise um, and not following the burn ban that the Division of Forestry issues every spring and fall is when it can happen. But our parcels are so small, we, we're landscapes broken up by road systems, and the responses are pretty quick. So we rarely get large out of control forest fires in, in Ohio. All right. Do we have any other questions? We forgot to mention at the beginning, you can either put a question into the chat. Or if you have a question, you can unmute and ask it. We did automatically mute everyone when they joined just so we didn't have the background noise and echoing that we can sometimes get. Does anyone else have a question for Dave? And we'll also probably wrap up with a question and answer session. So if you think of something later, you're welcome to ask it later. I, I have one. I have one question. Uh, Western, uh, Western Pike County. I, um, a friend of mine, he and I bought a, a clear cut. It was clear cut in 2009, 2010. 
the regeneration seems to be very much uh, oak on south, southwest facing hillsides. Um, on east uh, hillsides, it's more poplar or uh, tulip poplar and uh, maple and then a mix of other other species in different locations. But I found I find it odd that those oaks would regenerate only on that west or southwest facing hillside. Can you that explain? that is largely goes back to they're much more competitive typically on those drier sites or another way to look at it, the other species don't do as well there. So they seem to do better on those sites and it'll vary depending on how high up the slope you are. If you're up near the top, typically you're going to have uh, things like scarlet oak and chestnut oak. As you get on the more moist sl slopes further down, you're going to tend to get more red oak. But if without fire and without disturbance on a regular basis, then the oaks would probably get relegated, relegated to those drier sites. With historic fire um, following the initial land clearing with Europeans and even some of the fire that was here when, with Native Americans, then the oaks may have been distributed a little more widely on the landscape because fire was more prominent. And then in areas in Southeast Ohio, where the iron furnaces had an impact and fire was very extensive and clearing was extensive for a period of years, the, the oaks will dominate more site conditions, but not a big surprise to find them on the drier sites dominating. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, thank you, Dave. I think with that, we will go ahead and switch speakers and we will have Dave Runkle with Benton County Soil and Water go ahead and share with us the importance of oak to wildlife. Make sure Dave's able to share and talk. Okay, I believe I'm able to talk. Are you seeing my screen by chance? Yes, we are. Great, because I can't see it, so I'm going to wing it here. I'm having technical difficulties today. <laughs> So uh, thanks everybody for coming uh, from wherever you're at. Well, hopefully you're sitting somewhere where it's warm. Uh, my name is Dave Runkle. I work for Vinton Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, I've worked there for about four years now. Uh, before that, uh, while going to college, I worked for the Forest Service uh, Northern Research Station. So some of those studies that Dave had mentioned earlier, I actually got to participate in. So uh, I'm pretty versed in those. Um, after I worked for the Forest Service, I then worked for the Ohio State University and uh, did the same stuff doing research out there at the experimental forest. So while out there, we a lot of our research was on emphasizing oaks uh, and wildlife that is associated with it. So uh, I do have a decent knowledge of what we're going to talk about. So the first thing I want to talk about are the, uh, the game species that are either directly or indirectly uh, benefit from oaks. Uh, the game species I chose here are game species that the Division of Wildlife also agrees are game species. Uh, there are a few other ones that I'll mention later where some states they're game, but in Ohio they're not. Uh, but here in Ohio, uh, obviously we have deer, the white-tailed deer, uh, turkey, uh, wood ducks benefit from oaks. Uh, you got grouse, coyote, fox, raccoon, squirrel, and feral hog. Uh, the squirrel's a neat one because not only does the squirrel benefit from oaks, but it benefits the oaks as well by moving their seeds around for it. So that's a pretty, pretty neat relationship those two have built over the years. Uh, almost all of these photos here in front of us, with a few exceptions, were taken uh, in Vinton County. Uh, I really like the one with the turkey and the deer. Uh, that is a little opening in the middle of an oak hickory forest, and you can see the little black oak there starting to work its way into the opening. And those uh, Baby foxes and the mama fox that are playing, um, the wood they're playing on there uh, is down woody debris from coal tree removal. Uh, it was a equip practice put on that person's property to uh, remove some of the less desirable trees to open up more space for the oaks. So uh, that was a pretty cool win-win for everybody there. So how do those species ben uh, benefit? It's probably a fair question to ask. Well, as uh, David mentioned, food. Um, the acorns are very, very, very important to most, if not all, of our wildlife out there in the forest, uh, both red and white acorns. I think it's really important to know the difference between the two of them because they each have their own benefit at certain times. For example, your white, white oak acorns, um, they're 
they're not on the tree very long, so they're not packed with tannins. So they're, I guess you could almost call them tasty. Uh, because they don't have many tannins in them, which are preservatives, uh, they start to sprout as soon as they hit the ground. And occasionally they'll even look like that picture there with a little root popping out while they're still hanging on the tree. So if you're wildlife and you need to eat a, um, a bunch of oak acorns to build up some fat reserves for the winter, you really want to flock to those white oak trees in the fall time, because if you don't get to the acorn soon enough, all the energy is going to go underground, as you noticed in that photo earlier, the oaks put a ton of energy underground before they put anything above ground. So for wildlife, the white oak acorn is extremely important in the fall, in the fall time for the animals to build up a fat reserve to make it a good chunk of the winter. Then uh, there are no more acorns left once you get into December and January, or no more white oak acorns left, I should say. What's left are the red oak acorns. Uh, your red oak acorns, let, they sit on the tree for like 16 months or so, so they're packed with tannins and they don't taste very good. So if you were to walk through the forest right now, you will find very few white oak acorns because all the good ones have been gobbled up, but you'll probably see a whole bunch of red oak acorns. Now these red oak acorns are gonna lay there in the winter, all winter long, and it's gonna snow and it's gonna rain, and it's gonna snow and it's gonna rain. And every time we have precipitation, some of those tannins leach out. So throughout the few months of the winter, the tannins leach out and the acorns become more palatable. So late winter, January, February, the red oak acorns are extremely important for wildlife because if you've ever walked through the woods in January and February, there's not much to eat. So if you only have white oaks, your animals are going to be starving in February. And they really need those red oak acorns to get through to the growing season where they can start browsing again. Speaking of browse, <coughs> oak trees, uh, they... They are edible browse, but they're not preferred because they have all those tannins in them. They kind of taste bad, uh, but if you're hungry, you'll eat them. And there are a lot of insects that will eat only oak leaves, which we'll talk about for a little bit later. So acorns provide a ton of food for a whole lot of wildlife. Um, what else do, do oaks do for wildlife, right? So young oak stands, uh, generally speaking, are very thick and very dense. There's a whole lot of stems per acre. So they provide uh, a good, good safety for a lot of prey species. So if you were a prey species, maybe a turkey or a grouse, something's trying to eat you from the day you're born. So wherever you can get to a thick, dense area where you feel safe, that's where you're gonna live because it's better for your survival there. So a lot of species will use these young oak oak stands to uh, you know, grow to adulthood. For example, one of them is, uh, that I think is really neat is turkey poles. So turkeys need nesting cover. I've seen many a nest in the middle of the woods that get predated, and I've seen plenty that hatch in really thick stuff. Like the picture on the left is extremely thick. If you were trying to eat uh, turkey eggs in there, you'd have a hard time, one, locating them, and two, actually being able to get to them. So the young oak stands provide the cover for the, uh, for the poults and the, and the uh, eggs. Then once they hatch, these young dense stands have a ton of insects on them, which, which are exactly what the turkey poults need. They need that fresh protein. So in the springtime, the eggs hatch and they eat a whole bunch of little insects that are eating on the oak leaves. Uh, thus, everybody's happy. Uh, they also provide great nesting and denning sites. The obvious one for the nesting is you know, birds and trees. But you, I would also mention they're probably just as important or more important for um, denning mammals. So oaks do coat it very well. Um, that's compartmentalization of decay in trees, especially the white oaks. So when an oak tree does get a wound and it closes off that wound, it just kind of creates a little void in the tree. That void will stay there for like the life of the tree. And as David mentioned, those trees, what oaks especially last a very, very long time. So that den site is available for that, that animal for a very long time. Uh, generations of animals can use that same denning tree to procreate and, and uh, succeed in life. So those are some of the benefits to the game species. Uh, but as we all know, wildlife and the natural resource in general is a very, very complex tangled web, right? So yeah, oak trees can directly benefit all those game species by feeding them and giving them habitat and homes for the winter. But oak trees also host a slew of insects, for example. One single oak tree can support over 280 different species of insects, which I think is kind of mind blowing if you think about how many trees are in the forest and how many insects are living on those trees. Why do insects matter? Well, it's the food web. The insect eats the oak leaf, the bird eats the insect, 
and the cycle continues. The center picture there, I think, is pretty neat. Uh, that spider is eating a cicada, one of the 17-year cicadas. That spider is living on, uh, I zoomed in a little bit so you can't see the whole picture, but uh, if I were to zoom out, you would see that that is uh, on the left-hand side, it opens into a cavity in a red oak tree. Uh, so that's, that little oak tree wound is providing a home for that giant spider and uh, probably chipmunks and flying squirrels as well. Um, speaking of the cicadas, uh, the oaks seem, the 17 year cicadas seem to really like the oaks, uh, probably because the oaks are long lived so if you go underground expecting a tree to be there in 17 years, you probably don't want to pick a short-lived tree. So the 17-year cicadas seem to benefit from the oaks as well. And the picture on the right is uh, your standard oak webworm. As you can see, they can devour an entire leaf in a matter of a day or two. And if that picture were zoomed out, I'm sure you would see 30 or 40 other of those same worms eating those leaves as well. The image on the far left, I'm sure you've all seen some form of that one way or the other. Uh, that's your standard oak gall. A little wasp will lay an egg inside the leaf and the leaf kind of builds uh, like a shell around that egg and then the little insect hatches, grows out and flies away to be happy. Birds can benefit immensely from oaks as well. Um, so picture there, you got the cerulean warbler on the top. Uh, it's sitting on an oak, a white oak branch. Uh, the cerulean warbler seems to be tied almost directly to the white oak. And not only that, but uh, to get more specific, it really likes canopy gaps in white oak stands. So without a gap surrounded by mature white oaks, the cerulean warbler really seems to struggle. I, I, have, a, I have a thing, I like the scarlet tanager. I think it's a very pretty bird. So I included that picture. Uh, as you can see, that cerulean warbler is, uh, I'm sorry, scarlet tanager is sitting in a, uh, a white oak as well. Not only do they benefit these kind of birds that are gonna eat insects or maybe an acorn here or there and nesting habitat, but it also benefits things like the great horned owl. And I'll talk about why it benefits the great horned owl in just a second. But even things like the, the ruby-throated hummingbird benefits from oak stands, not necessarily because it drinks uh, nectar from the oak uh, flowers, but there are associated plants that grow in oak hickory forests that uh, that bird does prefer. Some of the non-game mammals that oaks are going to benefit, uh, as I mentioned earlier, on the left here, I got some predators. You got the bear and the bobcat. In other states, they are game species. In the state of Ohio, they are not. So I, I called them non-game mammals. Um, why does the bobcat benefit from oaks? Well, uh, it's, an, it's a carnivore, right? So it's not eating acorns, but it is eating the animals that do eat the acorns. So a good acorn crop means there's a lot of small mammals. A lot of small mammals means there's a lot of dinner for a bobcat. Bobcats also benefit from those early successional oak stands where it's really thick. Um, they seem to navigate through it and they hunt prey pretty good through those uh, thick habitats. Same kind of stuff for the bear. While the bear will eat acorns to fatten up for the winter, the bear is also benefiting from either small mammals that can get lucky and catch or some carrion that was dependent on the oak. So the bear directly benefits from the oak from the acorns and indirectly benefits from the oak by bonuses. Uh, you know, dead deer, squirrels, rabbits. Uh, the picture in the center is me before my beard went gray, holding a bobcat at the experimental forest uh, about 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, that was the study that got the bobcat delisted. Uh, as you can see in the picture behind me, yeah, there are pine trees, but if you look at all the leaves on the ground, those are all oak leaves. So the bobcats generally seem to prefer oak hickory forest, probably because the next thing I'll talk about is their prey. So mice are going to benefit immensely from at oak, oak hickory stands because obviously they eat acorns. So the more acorns available for the mice, the happier the mice are. The happier the mice are, the happier the bobcat is. And that picture there is a flying squirrel. Uh, they seem to need oak hickory forests. Uh, they tend to prefer to eat the hickory, but they need them both. So if you had a hickory stand, the flying squirrel is not going to do well. If you had an oak only stand, the flying squirrel will not do well. If you get a good diverse oak hickory forest type, the flying squirrels will do very well. Uh, they tend to nest in uh, dens and trees. So the oak trees having those long lasting dens uh, is a great benefit to the flying squirrel as well. And I've seen cases where you might have six, seven or eight flying squirrels living in one small cavity in an oak tree. And that's, that's pretty neat to see when they come out of there at nighttime. As you can see, they have those giant eyeballs uh, because they are a nocturnal flying squirrel. Other mammals that benefit uh, that I didn't mention that Dave did mention was the uh, the, the bats. Bats really, really enjoy the white oak. 
uh, as mommy bats, I should say. Uh, during the summer, they rear their young and, and nurse their young in those uh, scaly flakes of white oak bark that's usually higher on the oak tree. Something that kind of blows my mind is, uh, so those other things I mentioned kind of make sense, right? Like we know flying squirrels and mice are gonna eat acorns. We know deer ate acorns, but would you ever think that reptiles and amphibians benefit immensely from an oak hickory forest? Uh, that one kind of blew my mind. All three of these photos I've taken. Um, the timber rattlesnake seems to enjoy oak hickory forests. Uh, my guess is because in oak hickory forests, there are a lot of small mammals that depend on those oak trees. So if the oaks go away, those small mammals go away, and thus the timber rattlesnake goes away. Uh, the picture on the far right is an arboreal rattlesnake. rattlesnake. Uh, it's in a hickory, but it was right next to an oak. Uh, that's kind of a rare thing for them, but they do do it occasionally. Then as far as like amphibians and how do they benefit from oak trees? Well, they've done some studies out there, the experimental forests, where they did some vernal pools and they did a few pairs of them. They did vernal pools with oak hickory leaf litter and they did vernal pools with uh, maple leaf litter. And what they found was um, the oak hickory leaf litter had a be better survivability for the species that did colonate those uh, vernal pools. And then it's something to do with, and they're still figuring all this out, but it has a lot to do with uh, the tannin levels in the leaf and what that tannin level does to the acidity of the water and what other microorganisms live in those waters as well. So I don't think that science knows completely how valuable these oaks are. Uh, I think they have very important roles in our soil health as well. I know I kept it kind of short there, I apologize, but I want to leave some time for questions. And uh, even the makers of Disney understand the importance of the oak tree. All right, thank you, Dave. So I think the only question that's come in from the chat related to the wildlife is that there is more to oaks than acorns. The canopy in summer is a menagerie of various insects which are critical to feed birds. The birds that eat these protect the oaks. So does the oak need the wildlife or does the wildlife need the oak? Uh, that's a very good question. I would say it comes down to which came first, the chicken or the egg? All right, do we have any other questions for Dave? Okay, well, we'll keep right on going. Thank you very much, Dave. And I am actually next to talk about some of the management activities you can do for your oaks and your wildlife. Stephanie Downs, I'm with Division of Forestry and I serve as a service forestry coordinator in Southern Ohio and our NRCS liaison. So I work a lot with incentive programs available for private woodland owners. So I'm gonna talk about managing your woods for oaks and wildlife, things you can do, practices you can use, and some of the complexities that are involved in the management. So as you've heard already, oak management is complicated. It's not going to be a one-step process and it's not always linear. The same practices will not always work in different woodlands. And so most of our oak management strategies have to be tied to a specific property. You also saw the lifespan of some of our oaks. This management is long-term. So it's going to take a while to get where you want to be unless you're on one of those really great dry oaky sites as we consider them in Ohio. It's also something that requires frequent feedback. So it's not something where you can do an activity walk away from your woods and expect the oaks to grow and do well. You have to continually go in and monitor, see how they're doing, reassess and maybe change a plan. Figure out what you need to do in order to get those oaks to survive. We do have a lot of tools in our toolbox though and it look, comes to managing for oaks. So these are some of the most common. We're gonna to touch on some of these as we go through this, but we have a lot of options. So invasive plant control may be one of the top practices that are needed in a lot of private woodlands in Ohio to ensure the survival of your forest, let alone your oak forests. We can also use different forest and improvement activities to manipulate the composition or the structure of your forest to benefit your oaks. Dave absolutely mentioned prescribed fire, so we'll touch on that a little bit. Tree planting always comes up. 
everybody wants to plant oaks and hope that they do well. We'll talk about where that works and where that might not work here coming up. And then timber harvesting. So a final removal, removal of a stand and getting that just right blight level so that your oaks can compete with the other species. So the first one on the list is probably the most important and that is your woody invasive plant control. So many of our woodlands are infested with invasive plants from Asia or Europe or other continents. And the removal of these invasive trees and shrubs in a woodland is necessary for your nat native bio biological diversity. It's essential for getting light to the forest floor, for encouraging your seedlings and saplings to grow, and to improve your overall wildlife habitat. So our native diversity increases when we remove invasive plants from our woods and we actually get increased growth rates on our trees. So most people consider your understory as not direct competition because they're not competing for sunlight, but there have been studies that look at honeysuckle understories and they greatly slow the growth rates of your overstory trees by competing for water and nutrients out of your soil. And so removing those trees not only increases your diversity, but increases the growth rates on your overstory trees that aren't competing for sunlight, but need those other resources. And then wildlife habitat, there are a lot of studies looking at the negative impacts of invasive plants. So most people will look at an invasive like honeysuckle or autumn olive, which produce huge amounts of berries, bright red, attractive, very attractive for a lot of species, but they don't have the nutritional content that our native shrubs would have. It's basically the equivalent of a McDonald's drive through for us. They're everywhere, they're readily available, they're convenient, they're brightly colored, but it's junk food. So it doesn't actually provide our bodies with the nutrients that they need in order to grow. We have other invasives in our woods though as well. And so we have our woody invasives. So a lot of you are familiar with bush honeysuckle, autumn olive, privet, tree of heaven, polonia, and the list goes on. But there are also herbaceous invasive plants that do compete with our trees in the overstory. The one photo photoed here is Japanese stiltgrass. It is a very common invasive grass that you can find along skid trails, roads, hiking trails, and then spreading into the woods from there throughout the state. So this is one of our more recent within the last 20 or so years in Ohio, but it is one that is rapidly spread. And as you can see in that photo, it will form a dense mat where very little else can grow through it and actually survive. So this, is, this management technique is where you go in and you actually work to control those herbaceous invasive plants. So this is again going to reduce that competition. It's gonna open up for sunlight, allow native herbaceous to take its place, which is gonna be better habitat for wildlife, for your insects, better for soil quality. And it also is better for natural fire regimes. So this is an annual grass that when it dies, it just leaves a dense mat and it can actually increase intensity of wildfires in areas. And it's also going to increase that overall biodiversity and success of your seedlings and your acorns. If you think about an acorn falling into that picture, it's not going to get much sunlight and it's probably not going to do well. Or if you control that, then it's gonna hit bare soil. It's gonna get the sunlight that it needs as long as you manipulate your overstory and you're gonna have better success. The next practice I have on here is actually a group of practices. So this is called forest stand improvement. These are practices you can do by deadening or removing trees in your existing woods to improve the growth on the trees that remain. And we have a lot of different forest stand improvement techniques that we will use. The three most common for oak management are crop tree release, call tree management, and mid-story management. And some of these you've heard a little bit on already, but we're gonna go into a little bit more detail on what those are. And the two photos on this slide actually show trees that are marked for removal to favor the oak trees that are next to them. You notice the one has a G on it, it means girdle. They didn't wanna take it out because they thought they would cause damage to the oak trees. They just wanted to girdle it, leave it standing and let it slowly die. So if we look at crop tree release, this is one of the more common practices that we will use in young stands to help favor oaks. 
So the idea of a crop tree release is you pick your crop trees in your woods and the crop trees are those that meet your objectives. So in our case that we're talking about tonight, it may be choosing oaks for timber, it may be choosing oaks for wildlife, or it may be choosing species that meet other objectives, whether it's aesthetics, water quality, different aspects of wildlife habitat, or other timber species. When you go into a stand for crop tree release, you're generally looking for a maximum of 50 of your best trees in that stand per acre that you're going to pick, mark to keep, and then deaden or remove all the trees that directly compete with it to give that tree room to grow. So if you think about a forest, you stand and look up at the trees. Most of your trees touch canopies. There's not a lot of light for them to grow outward. Crop tree release removes those trees directly around your best tree and gives it space to grow out. A lot of times we will select oaks as our crop trees because they meet so many landowner values, whether it is wildlife, timber, aesthetics, some of them have beautiful fall color, they hold onto their leaves later, or other reasons. When we select oaks as our crop trees, we are favoring them, we are giving them room to grow, and we are increasing their rate of survival into your mature forest in the future. When your forest gets a little bit older though, then you start looking at other techniques. So crop tree release really depends on those young trees ability to respond to additional sunlight. Eventually as your tree ages, it does not respond to light as well. So at that point, it's not going to benefit as much from a crop tree release, but you can increase the growth and canopy size of your larger trees by removing what we term cull trees from your woods. So cull trees are those that have little value for meeting your landowner objectives, or they're just poor quality or poor species that don't help your woods long-term. What you're doing is you're reducing competition for the trees that you want to remain in your stand. And this can be used to remove poor quality trees around your oaks to increase canopy size and inc increase your acorn production for wildlife mats. This usually is less cutting than a crop tree release, but you are cutting bigger trees. So there are trade-offs with all of these management practices. And then the last forest stand improvement activity that I have here is mid-story management. So this is a technique used to remove that mid-layer of sunlight. And you saw Dave's photos looking up at the canopy of the forest, taking out that middle layer, increasing sunlight to the forest floor, and in a sense, this can be used to get the same structure you could develop with prescribed fire. So prescribed fire, we'll touch on a little bit, but it's a very difficult practice to implement on private land. So mid-story management can be used to kill those mid-layer trees that are creating dense shade, open it up, and not have to put fire on the landscape. The the con to that though, is that you don't get the other benefits of prescribed fire, such as increased nutrients to your soil, bare soil for your acorns to germinate and other benefits such as that. But this I've seen done on several different properties very successfully. The photo there is a private landowner in the Hawking Plateau area who removed beech and maple from the understory. And as you can see, you've got your larger oaks throughout the photo. And underneath almost all of the regeneration in that area were oak seedlings. So it was working very well on that property. But a lot of times it's taking out the maples, beech, ironwood, your understory, mid-layer trees that create dense shade. You don't necessarily want to become your future in the your forest in the future. So that brings us to prescribed fire. Prescribed fire is generally used with other practices to reduce competition and increase sunlight to get oak reproduction and success. So you can see the photo here is a private woodland burn. I believe this photo was taken by Cotton Randall who will follow me with our presentation. You can see the very scattered oak trees here. This was prescribed fire that was put on the stand after a shelterwood harvest. So a shelterwood harvest was completed where they took off roughly half of the existing forest 
open it up, get sunlight to the forest floor, but still have shade to develop mid-levels of light. And then the prescribed fire was put in this area to reduce competition from your thinner barked seedlings and saplings and encourage the oaks to re-sprout and do better after the fire. Fire is gonna be a little more difficult to put in. You need specific woodland conditions in order for it to be effective. You generally need oaks in your seedling, your sapling layer before the fire goes in. You're really encouraging them to grow faster after the fire. It also requires an area that you can contain, that you can control, that has burnable leaf litter, and you need to have a burn plan written by a certified prescribed burn manager for Ohio. There are also legal requirements, permits that need to be obtained. A burn manager has to be on site. You have to have it properly staffed. They have to have the right insurance and be trained to put that prescribed fire on the landscape. So it is a little bit trickier, but it can be done. It just needs the right conditions. So this is something you would want to work with a, a forester, a professional forester on, determine if your woods would suit a fire, if it would benefit your objectives, and if it would be feasible to put it on the ground. So the next one I have here is tree planting. When it comes to oaks, it's usually going to be best if you can reforest an open area and pick the oak species for the site. So you wanna make sure the species are going to be adapted to the site conditions. And again, we're looking at that moisture level, you're looking at soil condition, soil type, what's going to do best on that particular site. We can generally find at least one oak species to grow on every site in Ohio. So that's usually not an issue. It's just making sure they're going to survive. Tree planting can't be done alone though. So you can't just put the trees in the ground, walk away and hope that they're going to work. You generally need to do some site preparation before you plant. So control the weeds where those trees are gonna to grow to reduce competition. And then you also have to protect them after planting. So you can see in this photo, all the tubes are tree shelters. Inside each shelter is a little tree. And the overall goal here is to keep the deer from eating them and killing them back to the ground. And so it's fairly intensive, but then you get the highest survival rate. And whether or not you use shelters really depends on what your local deer population is, how many you plant, what else is around for the deer to eat, and all kinds of different factors. This is a long-term investment. So you saw some of those lifespans of oaks looking at, you know, 100 to 350 years. And so your oaks are fully mature. So a long-term investment, but if you have an area that's not in trees already, it's gonna be a good way to establish an oak forest or a oak dominated forest. And then lastly, we get to timber harvesting. So you saw Dave's quote there that cotton prey rarely works it has to be very carefully planned. So if you are considering a timber harvest, we do have some resources through the state and the best one here is Call Before You Cut. So the website's up here on the slide and maybe Dave, you can stick that in the chat as well. But Call Before You Cut is a way to get resources on all the different factors that you should consider before conducting a timber harvest. So most of us are an expert in our field. We're not an expert in everything. This is a way to get non-biased resources on timber management planning. Not all of our timber harvesting techniques are going to result in an oak dominated woodland. So you've heard that a little bit. Even if you have an oak forest now, your harvesting technique will help drive the future forest and the species that are going to survive and do well there. You should always use a professional forester to mark and oversee your harvest. A professional forester is different than a logger. And so making sure you hire somebody with forestry credentials, a forestry education to help with that harvest will make sure that the trees taken out meet your objectives and the timber harvest is planned according to what you wanna see in the future. It's also recommended that you work with a master logger when doing your timber harvest. And these are loggers who have a certification and have required trainings so that they can close out the sale, use best management practices, make sure the trails and roads are planned correctly and carry all of the required insurance, workers comp and other requirements such as that. So with our oaks, again, we need mid levels of light to regenerate these species. So a single tree, select cut, high grade, diameter limit cut, 
a lot of these harvesting types that are commonly used won't usually regenerate oaks. There's not enough sunlight reaching the forest floor for them to actually survive and replace that overstory. On the other hand, harvests such as a clear cut, a commercial clear cut, or a deferment cut is going to open it up too much. You're going to get too much sunlight, and it's going to result in more tulip poplar, maple, cherry, beech, other species that will grow faster in the sunlight. So what you get down to are a few harvest types that you can put in. A couple examples here are shelterwood harvest or carefully planned and marked group openings. They can be used with other practices, so some of the other things we've already talked about, and implemented to help regenerate oak. Again, it's going to require a lot of monitoring. It's going to require a lot of assessment. It's going to require some replanning when things don't go how you think it's going to. And the photo here in this, on this slide is a shelterwood harvest where you can see the shade that's being cast by some of those trees, but you can see a lot of sunlight's reaching the floor, but not complete sunlight. And so we're looking for that mid-level of light to get those oaks to do well. Now I've talked about all these practices. That's all well and fine, right? You know what, what you might want to do in your woods. Paying for it may be another matter entirely. So there are some funding sources available that can help with woodland management in Ohio and other states across the country. So the two programs that I'm gonna talk about tonight are the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, also known as EQIP, and the Conservation Stewardship Program, or CSP. So these are two incentive programs that help pay for the cost of management on private woodlands. I'm gonna start out with EQIP, because it's usually the introductory program for people who are new to these incentives programs. It helps you set the first practices that you've done in your woods, helps outline what the priorities are, and it is an incentive program that reimburses you for management that you're doing to improve the health and sustainability of woods. There, you can get equipped for other practices, as some of you may have pasture or ag land, and that would also be eligible, but we don't handle that in forestry, so we just look at the practices in woodlands that can be done to improve. It is a reimbursement program. So it is a program that's competitive. You actually apply for the program. All of the applications get ranked. Anyone who is funded then has the option to sign a contract. Once the contract is signed, you can start the work. And once it is completed, you would then get it inspected, signed off on, and paid for the practices. This does assist financially with non-commercial woodland management. So a lot of these things that we've talked about, like crop tree release, invasive plant control, it is costly. You do have to put money in, you have to put time and energy in. And so this is a way to help cover some of those costs. When we look at EQIP, there are a lot of practices available for woodland owners. So this is a list of all of the different things that you can get reimbursed for doing in your woods. So if you notice, a lot of these things we've already talked about. Brush management is invasive plant control. Herbaceous weed treatment, looking at controlling that stilt grass or garlic mustard or other herbaceous invasive, herbace, herbaceous invasive, sorry if I can talk here, prescribed burning is on the list. Um, get into forest stand improvement, you can start looking at that crop tree release, call tree, mid-story management. There's also some wildlife practices on here. So structures for wildlife helps you create brush piles or edge feathering to increase different habitat components for certain species of wildlife. Tree planting, the site prep before you plant trees, controlling weeds after trees. So all of these different options are available if you wanted to seek financial assistance for managing your woods. The Conservation Stewardship Program, or CSP, tends to be a little bit more advanced than EQIP. So both of these programs are run through the Natural Resources Conservation Service. It is another government agency that is, has directive under the Farm Bill to allow these cost share practices and offer them to woodland owners. CSP tends to be a longer contract length. So it tends to be for at least five years. You tend to have practices that are already being done and then you build on those. So it is an enhancement program where you build on management that's being done 
increase the resources and the quality of the resources on your property and maintains the work that's already being done. So you, it does assess the whole property, which is one thing to consider when you're looking at these properties or these programs. Equip, you can just sign up a few acres. There is no size limit. CSP, you have to assess the entire property, not just your woods. So it looks at bigger picture, go into everything. Everything gets looked at and you do get an annual payment for maintaining good conservation that's already occurring. So they have different resource concerns, uh, water quality, soil quality, plant productivity and health. And they'll look at what level of conservation is being done for these different things. All of the good work that you're doing on your property then results in an annual payment to maintain that. So if you're already managing your woods, you get an initial benefit through an annual payment. And then the additional work that you do on the property would be done through enhancements and practices. You would then get paid for that work as well. So a different program, a little more intensive. We generally recommend landowners start with EQIP, get a feel for the programs, a feel for the contracts, what the work involves. And then as they increase their management, can then move into the CSP program. These are programs run by the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So they do have eligibility requirements. And I put some of these on here. These are the big ones. You must control or own your forest land. It also has to be non-industrial. So it cannot be property you own to feed your own paper mill. You have to comply with adjusted gross income limitations. They do have a maximum income for you to be eligible. I highly doubt anybody on this call meets it. It is so incredibly high that you should be fine. There are highly erodible land and wetland requirements so that you're not causing soil erosion or causing degradation of wetlands if they're on your property. You need to have a written forest management plan. And Cotton's gonna talk a little bit about plans after this. So I will save that for him. And then complete all the required paperwork and sign a contract prior to starting the work. So again, it is a reimbursement program. They're gonna pay for what you do under the contract. Some of the benefits of these NRCS incentive programs is first of all, it's financial. It helps you complete some of this work where you're not going to get a benefit from selling timber. So a lot of this work is done in pre-commercial stands, your younger forests, areas where you're really working to improve the woodland so that it could be harvested in the future or so that it has better health, better quality down the road. You can use the money to pay for your own chemical in your own time, or you can use it to hire someone to complete some of these projects. So a lot of people are not comfortable controlling an understory of bush honeysuckle. And it's just something that's not within their physical limitations, maybe. So you can hire someone, have them complete the work, get reimbursed for it, and pay that the vendor that does the work for you. And then finally, it's just going to increase the overall health and sustainability of your woods. It's going to help you meet your landowner objectives. A lot of these practices are expensive and time-consuming. And so it's a way to get good management on your woodlands, get some financial benefits from it, hopefully help encourage your oaks, encourage your wildlife species, and make a better woods for the future. So it's general information for this upcoming year. If these are programs you might be interested in, there is a deadline to apply for 2022, which is January 14th. So that is coming up quicker than I would like. So it is coming up quickly. But if you would like more information, each county has a state service forester. So you can contact your state service forester you can contact the county NRCS office, but you do need to apply by January 14th. To apply, you have to do two things. You have to establish a farm record with the farm service agency in your county and complete an application for EQIP or CSP with your NRCS office. Those two agencies, the farm service agency and NRCS are generally located in the same building, which makes it easy. I do recommend calling ahead though. So a lot of the NRCS offices are not completely open, and I would recommend calling ahead to make sure there's going to be somebody there to take your application. And finally, just a few resources here. Um, if you're looking for your state service forester, you can see we have this nice long website that you can type in, or you can Google ODNR service foresters. 
and it will bring up a directory so you can find your state service forester. The Farm Service Agency also has a directory and the NRCS also has a directory. So I will try to put these in the chat after I'm done. That way I can just copy and paste. So with that, thank you all. And I will take any questions if you have them. I do have my contact information here. If you think of questions later, feel free to reach out. I've not been keeping track of the chat, Dave, sorry. Yeah, there is a question, let me find it again, about a good source of larger oak seedlings. And I'm trying to find it. Uh, Sean, is there a place where you would recommend to buy oak trees that are more mature to root and grow faster? There are a lot of private nurseries that will sell the larger stock. I don't have too many bulk nurseries that will sell large quantities of bigger oak trees. Sean, do you want to turn on your mic and clarify your question? Because are you talking about for regenerating in a forested setting or more of a landscape setting? Well, it doesn't sound like he's going to respond, Stephanie. So, okay. Well, if you're if you're planting a large area of trees, so like reforesting an opening field, you're generally better off going with smaller seedlings. They they have less shock from being transplanted from the nursery. The roots are able to take hold a little bit quicker, and you will get faster initial growth from those smaller seedlings than you do from bigger trees. Those you can actually order in bulk from a lot of different nurseries. Depending on the species, you probably want more as local as you can get. So especially pin oak. Pin oak has nutrient issues if you take it too far out of its native soil. So having a local seed source or seedling source is really important to get those oaks to be really healthy. If you're looking for larger trees to plant for your yard or landscaping, then the best bet is to find a local nursery that carries them. And I don't have any recommendations on which nurseries. Just make sure the stock looks healthy. Make sure it is disease free. Make sure they didn't get it from somewhere exotic and plant native species. Yeah, I agree too. And if you try to grow too large of a seedling, um, they those big roots that the oaks want to develop get damaged um, just the way natural or the way the nurseries have to lift those seedlings they often get damaged so anything more than a couple year old seedling occasionally you might be able to get a three-year-old seedling but much more than that they're gonna be really hard to come by on a large scale yeah. so other question was from susan and i think we've got her taken care of but she was asking for a list of invasive species and then specific removal techniques so i shared a couple resources for her okay um can we get a copy of tonight's slide deck somehow? So we are recording the whole thing. So that's one source of all the information. And then um, we, I'll have to talk to the other presenters, but I, sh I can put mine in a PDF mode. The problem is they're, so, they're probably going to be so large, it might be hard to share them around. Um, so let me think yeah. about that. If you have a specific slide deck that you want, go ahead and email or just let us know in the chat and that that instru that um, speaker can go ahead and send you theirs. Yeah. That might be the easiest way to do it. Yeah, the other option is I could probably post them and do a post on the Southeast Ohio Wood site. Um, so we'll, we'll try to do that. That's probably the easiest okay. way to get it. That way yeah. they can download it. So yeah, I'll that do works. that. And then we, we have everyone's email. So when we get that posted, um, everybody that registered for the meeting tonight, we should be able to send you a notice as to where you could find those. Okay, and I do see there's one. Is the CSP application different from the EQIP application? Oh, that's a good question. I don't actually know. I know that you complete the application with the NRCS office and you have to let them know which program you are applying for so that it gets placed in the right pile, so to speak. 
So if you go into their office, it may be the same application, you just check up different box. <laughs> but your county NRCS office, when they help you with the application, will be able to make sure you get into the correct program. And it does look like Douglas was most interested in the EQIP slides and the okay. details on EQIP. All right, that sounds good. Douglas, we'll get it to you. So we had another question from Tim about, is it feasible to start your own oak trees from acorns? And that is a definite yes. Um, yes but it can be complicated and you really need to do a little bit of homework because as Dave Runkel mentioned, there are differences. So white oak acorns need to be planted in the fall almost immediately and obviously protected from rodents. Um, and then red oak seedlings in that whole red oak group have to go through a cold moist period called stratification or you're not gonna get them to germinate. But if you want specifics on that, you can reach out to, I'll go ahead and reply with my contact um and another you can reach really out to good me. yeah another really good resource is you can actually search online for the woody plant seed manual it's a forest service publication that if you have a whole lot of spare time you could spend forever reading but you can find just about any species in ohio that you want and it will tell you how to germinate those seeds when to collect them what to look for in the seed what kind of cold period they need if they need scarified or basically the seed coat broken and it will tell you exactly what to do to try to germinate those plants. So that's a really cool resource. It is hundreds and hundreds of pages long. So it's not light reading, but you can just search for certain species or the oak group and look at how to germinate those seeds. I think that got most of them. Okay. Go ahead and introduce Cotton Randall, Division of Forestry, to talk a little bit more about landscape planning. Cotton? All right, thank you. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, it's showing cotton. Great. All right. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna. I'm Cotton Randall. I'm with the Ohio Division of Forestry out of our Columbus office. I oversee our, our private lands programs from the state level, um, and I'm I'm going to talk about landscape planning and management. Uh, speakers before me have covered some really interesting topics. Um, from wildlife to all kinds of fun work in the woods, and, and I got stuck with planning, but planning is critical. Um, you know, if, if we're going to make a difference on our properties, uh, and also, and I would argue even more importantly, across the larger landscape, you have to have a plan. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to get a little bit into kind of efforts that are going on right now, and then some things you can do on your own property to, to make a plan. Um, but before I do that, I always start off talking about benefits of forest, and it's relevant to making a plan as well because, you know, forests provide a, a whole a whole suite of, of benefits, whether it's wildlife habitat, food for wildlife or for people, timber, um, non-timber products like maple syrup. Uh, I do some backyard syrup production myself, and it's a lot of fun and yummy. Uh, we've already talked about oaks uh, and the value of, of oaks and acorns, uh, recreation, whether you're doing it on your own property or on public land, uh, water, clean water, aquatic habitat. Um, and so I, I always try to frame it in all the benefits and how can we sustain these benefits into the future. And um, <clears throat> we've been working in Southeast Ohio uh, specifically on some targeted oak management research. Uh, and it's been a multiple agency effort, uh, working with uh, many other partners as well that are non-governmental. Um, on all of our slideshows up until now, there's been a, a bunch of agencies across the top. Um, those are some of the core agencies working in Southeast Ohio on oak management, but there's a lot of other partners that aren't there, like Soil and Water Conservation Districts, Dave Runkles with one of them, uh, National Wild Turkey Federation, uh, and, and many groups. Um, and We've, we've kind of shifted thinking about all lands in our planning, not just public land, not just private land, but and not just a single property, but how to really to make a difference with the resource and sustain uh, oak forest. But we need to come up with a plan that's applied across a larger landscape, across multiple ownerships. And, and oak forest, that's, that, that's kind of been our focus. Uh, some of the earlier talks pointed out why we're concerned about oak and why it's so important to sustain oak. Um, and so, right within the past six or seven years, we've kind of identified this 
17 counties in Southeast Ohio as a, a Oak Management Priority Forest Area. Um, and we've been working across all ownerships. And, and in this map, you can see the different colors are different state and federal ownerships. And then pretty much everything else is private land. And there are some working groups uh, through these, these, these partnerships and collaborative efforts. And there's a private lands working group and, and a lot of us are, are involved with that group. And so we're doing a lot of the planning as far as what can we do with our agencies to support this management on either our own land or on private lands. And obviously uh, folks on the call today are, are interested in your own properties and, and the private land side of things. Um, and we've gone even, zoomed in even further than just the 17 counties of Southeast Ohio. Uh, there's also uh, this blue circle that's up there it's kind of a, a, focal, a focal area that we're working on called the Hockey Plateau Project. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And if you're in that area, then there's some, there's some other things going on that, that I'll let you know about. But a lot of what we're talking about applies beyond that focus area, even beyond the 17 counties statewide. Um, but I wanna make folks aware of that. So if we're talking about that Hockey Plateau landscape, uh, it gets its name from Eco regions that uh, or ecological subsections that Dave mentioned earlier, and he had the same map where he had these two different uh, regions in Southeast Ohio, the purple and the yellowish color on this map. Those are the Hocking Plateau uh, subsections. And the eastern, the, the yellow one is East Hocking Plateau, and the purple one is Western Hocking Plateau. And there's a focus area right in the middle there that, that on the previous map had, had a lot of public lands, uh, Athens District of the Wayne, uh, several state forests, uh, Benton, uh, Benton Furnace and Zaleski State Forest, state wildlife areas like Wallace of Dowd and Waterloo, along with a lot of, of private lands mixed in. And we kind of identified that as a manageable area that we can do some targeted outreach uh, and a little bit um, uh, uh, enhanced outreach to, to try to to work on this oak issue. And so uh, some of the planning that we've been doing up until now, uh, I mentioned, you know, there's, there's interagency planning going on, uh, mostly state and, and federal agencies along with other partners. And there's some effort to do that work on public lands across ownership. So even, even on public land, we haven't in the past done a lot of cross boundary work. It's been, what are we do, gonna do on our property and another agency is doing what's on their property. Um, but with this uh, energy teamwork and this focus in Southeast Ohio, we've, we've started doing uh, more planning where we're planning projects that occur across um, public land boundaries, state and federal. And then uh, on private lands, um, there, we are developing a Hocking Plateau landscape plan. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Again, it's, if you're in that kind of focus area, then that's something that you could, you could uh, contribute to. And if you're outside of that, you can still contribute to the greater uh, oak management effort. And so, I mean, Stephanie mentioned management plans. Um, those are kind of where you start on private lands when uh, planning out your practices, you first evaluate what you have and it's, it's written by a professional forester. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it because some of you may already have management plans. If you don't have a management plan, then the first step is to reach out to your forester. And Stephanie mentioned how to find out uh, what state service forester covers your county. And there's also private consulting foresters out there. Um, but a management plan uh, kind of lists these, these basic, has these basic uh, components of it. Uh, starts off with just basic information about the property. What are your goals and objectives for the property or priorities? It has a map with, with four stands, a description of each of those stands. And the stand is just kind of a, a management unit within the, the woods that maybe has the uh, same characteristics, but, but across the whole property, you have different forest types with different characteristics. So you divide those up into different stands for management. And then there's a schedule of activities, uh, recommendations on what you can do to improve the health and productivity of your woods and, and meet your objectives. Um, and then at the, at the end of that, that's kind of most of the property specific stuff, but then there's a section that lists a bunch of different resource concerns for the property. It goes over soils, water, um, threatened endangered species, uh, unique sites, um, it, it'll have uh, forest health issues and, and things like that. And then uh, a, lot of, a lot of these woodland stewardship management plans, these are kind of all, all inclusive plans, will have an appendix with a lot of 
supporting information on how to do different practices, what are some common forestry terms, et cetera. Um, so I, that, that's something that, uh, like I said, reach out to a forester. That's the first step to, to getting a management plan. Um, we More and more private consulting foresters are the primary foresters that are doing these plans, but you can always start with your, your state service forester to, to, to find out what's available to you and, and how to find a forester to write a plan for you. Um, but in this focused area that I, that I showed the map of earlier, um, Hawking Plateau landscape, we've been working on kind of a new approach. It's a little bit different and we're not, it's not quite there yet, but we want to go ahead and just share. And if it's something that interests you, then we'll give you a person you can contact uh, for when this does become available. But it's, it's a landscape plan approach, which is a little bit different than the traditional within stewardship management plan. Uh, it's a two document plan that has a forest resource section which is kind of like that resource concern section at the end of a reg regular plan, but it's more specific to the landscape in question. And in this case, um, the Hawking Plateau landscape. So it's a relatively small area. It's a little bit over a county. It, it touches multiple counties, but it's maybe a county a half and a half in size. Uh, and it talks about maybe what, what it, you know, I'm gonna get through some of the components of it, but it might tell you these are the most common invasive species and the most common forest types. Uh, in that area. In the Hawking Plateau, it's focused on um, sustaining oak forest. Um, but then it also, so that's the, the landscape plan document, which is the forest resource concerns. And then there's a property specific document, which is the woodland management plan. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that has. Um, and if you have both of these together, then you can meet some of the, it meets the standards for Woodland management plans or forest management plans, which are required to participate in some programs like the NRCS program uh, that Stephanie mentioned before, as well as some other programs like tree farm program. So that first document, that, that landscape plan document talking about resource concerns, this is a little bit more specific what's in this Hawking Plateau um, plan document. Uh, it, it's a description of the, the the landscape, it gets into some of those ecological subsections that, that Dave and I have mentioned. Um, it talks about what are the key forestry issues in this, in this specific landscape? What are the most common forest management activities? It's gonna talk about oak regeneration because in Southeast Ohio, that's one of the big issues that we're dealing with, a lack of regeneration. What can we do to uh, improve the regeneration of oaks? Um, it talks about other forest health threats, invasive plants, invasive species. Uh, soil and water resources, climate uh, that, that you find in Southeast Ohio or in this Hawking Plateau uh, landscape. And then it has a section on wildlife, uh, rare communities, fire, cultural. It's got a section on climate change and carbon. And then a summary. So this is, it's kind of a good uh, kind of base document giving you uh, a little bit more intimate knowledge of, of the landscape that your property is in if you're in this landscape and some of the issues that you may see on your property, but it's not property specific. It's kind of generalized across that, that landscape. Um, but then the second part of that landscape plan is that property specific plan. And, and it's got a lot of the same components as that general wilderness stewardship plan I mentioned before, uh, landowner property information, management goals and priorities, and a map with four stands. And then and it has the stand descriptions and a management activity schedule, but that's it. And it's just, it's a little bit more streamlined, doesn't have everything that's in the, the, the wilderness stewardship plans that we uh, have written uh, for, for decades. Um, but some of the components that are required for some of those programs are found in that larger landscape plan. So they kind of complement each other or supplement each other. So that it's combined, you have uh, what you need for, for program participation. So um, that was it. I wanted to just introduce uh, that that's coming down, down the pike and, and also get a little bit of information about some of the other planning that's going on in, in Southeast Ohio, and in particular in the Hawking Plateau area. Um, the landscape plan document is, is almost finished uh, and it should be finished early this next year, early in 2022. Um, if you're interested in that, it's a voluntary thing you sign on to, but basically it's you know, just like any of the management plans by themselves, there are voluntary documents that are meant to just help guide you in managing your property better, meeting your goals. Uh, some programs do require them, but the plans themselves are voluntary, and so is this landscape plan. 
But if you're interested, uh, Danielle Lampley is a state service forester um, who uh, is going to kind of help coordinate this. And uh, that's her email there. Um, and she's also on the, the service forestry directory that Stephanie referenced earlier. Um, and even if the plan isn't interested in, in, isn't isn't something that you're interested in, uh, there is still, like, like was talked about earlier, a lot of different options to get work done on your property. So just another plug for, for the NRCS programs, EQIP, CSP, there's that January 14th deadline coming up. And you can again work with your, your local service forester to kind of get the background on that or your soil and water uh, district forester. Um, and you'll have to apply at the, the NRCS office. Um, and I think, yes. So I'll end with that. The future of Oak is in our hands. Um, you know, one of the, the things that we're hoping to achieve with this landscape plan is, um, you know, it's, it's kind of something that we, an opportunity for everybody to work together on, on a bigger cause. Uh, and and we, we feel strongly about the cause of, of sustaining Oak Forest. And, uh, and we can have the biggest impact if we work together across all, all ownerships. And uh, with that, I think I've, I'll take questions for my stuff. And then uh, I think we also have plenty of time for questions about any of the previous speakers tonight. Cotton. Thank you very much, Cotton. Yeah. I'm Go working ahead, backwards a little bit, but there is a question about from Tim. Um, mentioning that most of the information is geared towards Southeast Ohio, but he's in Licking County. So he's just a bit to the North of the area that we've been focusing on. So, um, people trees starting to take over, but I do have a lot of white oak saplings. So I don't know if you want to address, I mean, areas outside of Southeast Ohio or not cotton. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly, like I said, there, we do have some targeted planning going on in Southeast Ohio. Um, but we, it's, it's an issue across the state. Um, and it's the same, really a lot of the same resources are available to you. You have state service foresters, uh, there's local staff at the soil and water conservation district. Um, I would probably start with your state service forester, uh, in Licking County. That's Jason Van Houten and his contact information is on that uh, directory. I don't know if we sent a link to the directory, Stephanie, but maybe, um, we could do that if not. Yeah, it's been put in the chat. Okay. Along with the Farm Service Agency directory and the NRCS directory. Yeah, and and so I mean, we are doing some focus work in Southeast Ohio, but almost all of the things we've talked about apply statewide. Equip program is a statewide program. CSP is a statewide program, and, and a lot of the, the professional forester and other natural resource professionals, uh, there's resources out there to, to help you. And I think that was all the questions specific to your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for anyone, either in the chat or again, you can unmute and ask a question for any of the speakers or questions about wildlife and oaks in general. All right. Well, if you think of any afterwards, you can send any of us an email or give us a call. And actually I do see one just came in. What's a reasonable survival rate for oak samplings? And Dave, if you might have any data on that. Is that a <laughs> question about planted ones or is that a question about in nature under a natural setting, Susan? And I think she responded planted. Yep. Yeah. It, it's highly variable, but... Um, Again, it comes down to planting on the right sites and everything, but if it's planted correctly and they're protected from deer, and probably most importantly, weed control, you can get pretty high survival rates um, under normal conditions. I'd hate to guess what that number would be, but you could probably get 75% plus survival rates under normal years, but if you have a severe drought or something, those numbers could be bumped way down. So. Um, but it all comes down to your management. Um, if it's the right species is selected and you're working with a good forester to help you with that and protect them, you can get pretty high survival rates. I do have another question. 
um, have our harvesting techniques degraded the genetics of white oak? I don't know that we have an answer for that. I don't, yeah, I don't either. I really don't. I would guess if, you know, prior to some of our harvesting techniques, some of that extensive agriculture that greatly eliminated a large majority of the trees might have had a larger impact than, than our harvesting techniques. But we're certainly typically tar targeting and harvesting the most valuable and the straightest and the highest quality trees. So I suppose it could, but I, I don't know there's been anything, any studies that could verify that or not. It's a great yeah, question. I can't think of any. I know there is some effort through University of Kentucky uh, with folks at the Hardwood Tree Improvement Center at Purdue as part of the White Oak Initiative where they're looking at white oak and white oak genetics and trying to improve genetics, um, mainly through breeding type programs. And then the last thing I see, it looks like Tim has a pretty spectacular black oak that toppled over. That was 270 growth rings at eight feet high and 52 inches in diameter at eight feet. That's a monster. Yep. And then Marty put in the chat that there is equip funding for several practices to promote turkey nesting and brood rearing habitat. This is a new initiative for this year, and NRCS has increased payment payments from 75% to 90% on some of these practices, so you do get a little bit better money on them. So if you've been considering managing for turkey, she says now is a good time. That is very true. I know some of the practices covered, at least for forestry, include invasive plant control, so the brush management for woodies and herbaceous weed control. Yeah. Yeah. It's so you're right. It's that. And then it's also, um, just wildlife habitat planting. So that could, that also includes pollinator plantings. So multiple, bene mul multiple benefits there, riparian forest buffers, um, edge feathering and early successional habitat development and management. So there's a lot of, a lot of options there for folks. Yeah. That is a really good opportunity that it is new this year. Thank you, Marty. <laughs> And Marnie Tichinell is a wildlife specialist with Ohio State University Extension based out of Columbus. So another great resource for folks that need assistance with wildlife. Okay, so once again, if you come up with questions afterwards, I did have my contact information on my slide. I will go ahead and put that in the chat before I jump off. But if you have questions, please reach out. There are a lot of professionals willing to help with oak management, woodland management, anything in between. So I wanted to thank all of our speakers tonight for providing great information. Thank all of our attendees for coming and listening to our talks and hopefully we can help promote oak management in Ohio's woodlands. And I'm gonna, before I close out, I'm gonna go ahead and put my information in. Sorry, I can't type my email correctly and talk at the same time apparently. All right, well, hopefully everyone has a great evening. Great holiday season coming up. Thank you all for joining.